thanks to Rob and to the McEwen group for putting this session on. It's, uh, it's great to be able to be here. I've, uh, I spent my last 30 years at uh, PwC and was their uh, global mining leader, had another of uh, other leadership positions there throughout, uh, throughout the years. And once I uh, decided on what I was going to do for my, uh, my next career, um, I, uh, I started talking with, uh, with Artisan, which is, in, which is looking at technology for mining. And I know the mining industry needs technology first to help address the cost side, but also uh, to address a lot of the corporate social responsibility issues, the greenhouse gas issues, the health and safety issues. And what this, uh, <coughs> what battery powered electric technology does is it, uh, it helps address all of those. And I want to talk a little bit today about, uh, I can talk about the health and safety a little bit, the greenhouse gas, but everybody knows that and that everybody feels that. I think what's really important is uh, the cost side, so I'll focus on that a little bit. Um, <coughs> the markets, uh, the mining industry has certainly been a challenging one over the last few years. Um, I, uh, I still have, I, I remember, uh, I remember uh, Rob McEwen giving this speech once and handing out, I forget the dimensions, but I still have it at home, but he handed out a, uh, a Zimbabwe currency note, and I think it was $100 billion or something like that, to really drive home the point of how debasing impacts gold uh, prices and, uh, in, a, in an inverse uh, re uh, relationship. We've seen the U.S. do a lot of debasing. And now uh, I think the world is stopping, is not believing anymore that interest rates are going to go up and that debasing is going to stop. Um, and I think that we'll, uh, we're seeing some favorable impacts on gold that I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think will drive people, to, uh, the mining companies, to get into this technology and to make the investments in what they need to do and get the, uh, the right long-term benefits in this. Um, so I've just been with the company for uh, since January, so a very interesting three, uh, six months. I've, uh, I've said throughout uh, my career I was a mining industry expert, uh, expert and I've now, uh, the last six months I realized that was a lie. I really didn't know much about the, uh, the operating side and how the engineering side of mines work. Um, and I've been learning, uh, learning a lot about it and I've been, uh, it's been quite interesting and eye-opening to see what's out there. Um, <coughs> I'm going to go through first, uh, let's make sure I can keep on time here. Um, <coughs> so that's our advertising, which I'll get back to later. Um, electric's been around for, uh, for a while in the mining industry, and I know Dave and with uh, the Valley team up in Sudbury has been uh, certainly been using that for a long time. A lot of deep mines there that need this technology for, uh, for ventilation issues. Uh, some, uh, but the way they've been done has not typically been with battery. There's been some battery applications, but for the big pieces of equipment, such as the haul trucks and the, uh, the loaders or the scoops, um, those have been done by either using uh, trailing cables or, uh, in the case of scoops, or overhead catenary lines in the uh, case of the haul trucks. And there's been some challenges with that. Um, the, the cables, uh, tend to be, you know, uh, they'll run well for a while, but occasionally you run into an issue where they're uh, uh, too short on one end, for, uh, we might say, right? They're, uh, they just run out of room and you can't uh, go where you really want to. So that tends to be the issue with the, uh, with the trailing cables. If uh, they can have some very expensive maintenance, uh, the equipment can go out of uh, production when you need to replace them. They're very expensive to replace. So there were some challenges that that have brought out that, uh, yeah, they're still in use, but they haven't been as popular as they could be. Uh, the overhead catenary lines again work uh, work great, uh, but they're expensive to put that uh, that infrastructure in place in order to run those. So those uh, that's been some of the challenges with the electric technology that's made this happen. Um, the benefits that people are after when they go towards electricity is one they're they're uh, on the cost side they're looking to reduce their ventilation costs. So ventilation is very expensive. Uh, the the uh, the the airways that need to be built when building a mine are expensive to, uh, to build. Uh, the fans are very expensive. Uh, uh, the co cooling plants, if needed, are very expensive. Um, I know we're looking at one deal where the mining company had to have uh, 
uh, 15 megawatt cooling plant and that was a very challenging and very expensive proposition. Um, and I, I understand South Deep and so in South Africa that that mine had 125 megawatt cooling plant. And these are, if people were, you know, cringing over 15, imagine 125 and what the, that does to for you. So that, that whole CapEx part uh, is a very important one in the uh, mining industry that can be addressed with, uh, with electric. On the, uh, on the operating side, it's also important because they can, uh, uh, the power cost to drive that ventilation down is quite uh, significant. Um, and the savings that can come out uh, when we can reduce the power requirements and the airflow requirement, uh, reducing the, uh, re any reduction provides a higher um, cost savings than you would think. So if you can reduce 40% of your CFM requirement, you're going to save more than 40% on your power. And um, the reason is how this is uh, explained to me. Um, and my, my, my analogy that I like to give, I was, uh, I had my, uh, I was, uh, I'm a canoe trip guy, so I buy, you know, bags and all compact stuff that I can fit in my bag is, uh, and make it as small as possible. So when I get my uh, sleeping bag, I'm stuffing it into the bag. And first few, hand, few, first few times I stuff it in, it's pretty easy. It flows down pretty easily. The last one, I'm kind of like really pushing to get it down. And that's the same thing with the airflow. As you try to get that last sort of 20% of your airflow down, it's a lot more power required to push it down the mine than the first 20% is. So it's an interesting, uh, an interesting way to look at the savings you can get from, uh, from going with electric. Uh, the labor efficiency is another very important part of this. I was talking with one mining company and uh, they're going through, they're operating in, uh, in a hot jurisdiction in the U.S. and uh, they had this wonderful way of framing how, uh, how, how labor costs are when they're operating in hot places and how it's more expensive in the U.S. and the way that they said it was there's some uh, spatial, uh, di there's some aspects to the uh, spatial dynamics of the U.S. workforce that make them to need more frequent breaks when it's a hot temperature. And uh, I kind of like that because basically what the person just said is they're a little carrying a few extra poundage in uh, the U.S. so that kind of makes them not be able to work as hard. But that is some of the issues that when you are underground it's going to take a little bit more uh, uh, it's going to be take, it suck a bit more of your energy out if the temperature is really hot, and if you can go to an electric solution that has a cool, cooler working uh, place, uh, that's great for uh, labor efficiency. Um, <laughs> the heat generation by equipment is uh, starts out being roughly a third if it's uh, electric equipment versus diesel equipment, and that's because of the efficiency of the equipment. So when uh, when uh, diesel equipment does work, uh, of the power that goes into the diesel equipment, 30% of it actually does the work. Uh, and whereas with an electric uh, equipment, 90% of the power that goes in does work. Um, all the power ends up being heat, but that means you can do it uh, with a third of the power you can get the work done with electric. So a lot less heat is being generated. There's some other aspects that uh, also result in less heat, and that's the braking. When when braking uh, on a diesel equipment, the, uh, the braking generates heat. Uh, when you brake with electric equipment, uh, the way we design our equipment is that the braking function regenerates the battery. So it does not give up heat, it actually regenerates, which actually saves on the, uh, on the amount of power that has to go into the battery to charge it. Um, <clears throat> Health and safety standpoint, um, and, I, and I should have led with this, every, every mining meeting I go to, we always want to talk about health and safety and the impact, and the uh, diesel fumes are, uh, are cancer-causing. Uh, the World Health Organization's labeled them a carcinogen. The, uh, there was a case in, uh, in Quebec, a uh, lower level case, but the mining company uh, was found liable. The worker who had worked there for 25 years uh, had cancer and uh, ended up taking an action against the company and was successful. Um, and from some some mining companies I talked to, it's, it's just Quebec, it's just a lower court. We're not worried about it that much, but the reasoning behind it is uh, it, this, this, uh, this can happen. It's not outside the realm of possibility that this can be expanded. I get that mining companies can't go out spending crazy amounts of money in order to make things 100% safe. You can't make things 100% safe in a mine. Uh, I get that point. 
but as the technology gets better, I think this is going to be uh, uh, something that needs to be looked at hard from a risk management perspective from, uh, uh, from the mining company's perspective. And greenhouse gas is certainly more uh, very popular now. That's coming down. So there will be some extra savings that come in from the greenhouse uh, uh, gas credits that come up in cap and trade. Um, I want to go through quickly about what's happened and why the technology is where it is and why we're excited that battery technology is here and it can make things, uh, it can make things happen. Uh, we've had our, uh, we've had our uh, systems in place at Kirkland Lake Gold for four, almost five years now. Uh, the, since the first uh, LHD went up, uh, we've worked with a couple of different OEMs up there and uh, they now have, I think, 27 pieces of battery powered equipment. Uh, so this isn't, a, it, is, it isn't a new technology. Um, but it's the, it's, it's, it, it uses the lithium-based battery chemistries that have allowed uh, the additional power to be generated that can power the haul trucks and can power the, uh, the scoops that are going through their mucking cycles. Uh, that was a challenge to do with some of, the, uh, some of the other chemistries that have been used for years doing uh, locomotives and things like that underground. Um, the, what's, and what's happened is around 10 years ago that the uh, lithium-based chemistries uh, came into vogue. Uh, Tesla uh, started using them in their, uh, in their Roadster in 2008. And um, in 2010, uh, we were asked uh, by Kirkland Lake Gold to start considering solutions uh, using these battery chemistries that can help uh, power the underground in, uh, at their Macassar mine. Um, lithium cobalt has been the uh, chemistry that's been used by Tesla. Uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous chemistry in one sense in that it has uh, a very high energy density. Uh, one of the issues that we've seen with batteries is that they don't last the sh full shift. We need these things to last the full shift for miners to be really comfortable with using them and we've seen that they don't last and that's because of this concept of energy density. So you need to have uh, enough energy in the battery cells that you can create the power you need for as long as possible and lithium cobalt has a really good energy density so it's it, uh, in one sense it would be great for mining uh, but we won't touch them with a 10-foot pole and the reason is that the, uh, there's, a, there's a fire hazard with them. Uh, the stories of the, uh, the Dreamliners going down because of battery uh, malfunctions, uh, that's been because of, that's been lithium cobalt batteries. And uh, the, I, 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 I get Tesla using them in cars above ground, um, but if a fire is going to start in your car, hopefully you'll have enough warning. You can pull over on the road, uh, you can watch your lovely car burn, uh, but it's not like everybody's going to die. Uh, an underground fire is very different. You can't have a fire underground and we're not willing to take that risk with lithium cobalt. So we need to go, we need to give up on that wonderful uh, energy density benefits that lithium cobalt has and look at some others. Um, <laughs> it's my dramatic picture of the fire risk. Um, so the, the chemistry that we've gone with is lithium iron phosphate and that's the one that's in all of our uh, vehicles that are in use in uh, Kirk and Lake. We're not, um, we're, we're, we're not saying, oh, we're just going to use this and not others. We're following all the other chemistries, and we will use them at certain times. If lithium cobalt becomes 100% safe, we'll use it in a heartbeat. Uh, right now, it's not there. Uh, lithium iron phosphate does not have the energy density that the uh, lithium cobalt batteries have. So if we have haul trucks that are going up steep grades, fully loaded, uh, they're going to need to swap their batteries. Uh, we're not going to be able to last full shift on it. A lot of the scoops on the mucking cycles can get through the shifts without a, uh, without a swap. Uh, and that's great. They can, there's a lot of time between shifts to charge, uh, so they can do that. But we're not willing, uh, we're, we're not able at this stage to be able to get there with uh, the big trucks hauling up ramp fully loaded. Uh, so that requires Excuse that. Excuse me. Yeah. Is that an eight hour shift or a 12 hour shift? Uh, we've been looking at 12 hour shifts, but we kind of get that into the seat time. And that's how we, we calculate it based on seat time. So you can have the, you can have the longer. So it, yeah, it could come out a little less than eight when you look at the, the seat time. So there's the time to go up, time to go up, time to come down, the health meetings, clearing blast fumes, and getting to the equipment. And by the time that happens, it's down to 
probably less than eight hours. Tesla claims they can change the batteries in 90 seconds. Yep. Robotic battery change. How quickly do you change yours? Ours is, uh, ours is the, the fastest they ever did it was, uh, I think they did one in eight minutes. They're quite proud of that and advertise that to everybody. But we tell people 15 minutes, 15, 10 to 15 minutes. And what needs to happen is going into the, uh, so we'll have, we will strategically place the charge stations. And um, the trucks will pull into the charge station. Uh, we need a five ton crane to take the battery off the truck and put it on the charger, take the fully charged one, put it on the truck. That's a 10 to 15 minute process. We'll say 15 minutes for, we model it at 15 minutes when we do our simulations to make sure the trucks can hoist, uh, can, can, can haul the number of tons that they need to haul. Okay. Um, on the fire side, if a lithium, uh, lithium iron phosphate uh, cell uh, fails, uh, there's no fire risk uh, with the lithium cobalt. That's where the uh, that's where the that's the fire risk is if the cell fails. If the cell fails in a lithium iron phosphate, and we've had uh, we've had that happen once in five years, uh, it lets off a uh, a mist that isn't toxic. Um, it's the type of it's the type of thing that might uh, you might have to rub your eyes if you get it right in your eyes, uh, but it's not toxic. It's not going to cause any harm. Uh, there's no risk of uh, of igniting. Um, it will burn um, if if a, if a fire is caused, but for some other reason, uh, this battery cell will burn, uh, much like a piece of wood would burn. Uh, it can be put out with regular uh, fire extinguishing equipment that you would have underground. Uh, if there was such a big fire underground that your your uh, battery cells would catch on fire, you'd probably be a little more worried about the tires on the uh, equipment catching on fire than you would about the uh, the battery cell. So we view this as being no significant fire risk, uh, but it certainly is something that needs to be discussed uh, because there's this negative uh, reaction to fire and, uh, and batteries now. Um, <clears throat> lithium titanate is another interesting one that we're following in that uh, uh, the lithium iron phosphate uh, batteries take around two and a half hours to charge. Uh, the lithium titanate can fast charge. You can charge them in 15 minutes. That's the one uh, very interesting benefit of that uh, chemistry, and it's one that we're following quite a bit. Um, there are there are some issues with it. If all uh, the benefit of having such a fast charge is you don't have to swap, so you can just leave it on the equipment, swap in between shifts, swap at lunch hour, or sorry, not swap, charge it at lunch hour. Uh, but to do that, you need to get uh, if you have a 165 a kilowatt. Uh, battery pack and you need to get all that power going into the battery in 15 minutes you need to have a lot of electricity being pushed down there's no way to get around that and if you're going to be doing your whole fleet at lunch hour uh, there are some electricity dynamics that need to be addressed in order to make that work um, nonetheless it's a really interesting technology and one that uh, one that I think will have its place it's also it's currently quite expensive uh, say three times the cost of the lithium iron phosphate. So the, it, it is expensive too, but again, it's, it's one that we do like that technology and I, I think it will have its place in the future. Um, Kirkland Lake Gold story was, uh, was one that they, they needed to get to, uh, um, they were working along the East West Fault. They found some mineralization on the south side of their property. Uh, very high grades, they wanted to get to it. They could, uh, they could, uh, they could tunnel over, uh, mine the product, tunnel back to their existing hoist infrastructure. That was no problem with the economics, uh, but when they looked at the ventilation, they would have to sink a ventilation shaft, and that would have uh, been uh, that would have had a drastic impact on uh, the economics, given how deep their mine was. Uh, so instead of uh, building the ventilation shaft, they looked. Uh, they came and found Artisan, and uh, started talking with uh, with us and a small OEM about uh, building electric powered equipment. Uh, we've done that. They use electric powered equipment over in that part of the mine and that's been a, you know, that's been a big part of the, uh, of the success of the South Mine Complex at Kirkland Lake Gold was the ability to be able to do this. Um, uh, the second last CEO at Kirkland Lake Gold was a big Copco fan and, uh, and wanted to 
work with COPCO and with us to start doing, uh, putting our systems in COPCO equipment. Our relationship with Atlas COPCO started then. Atlas COPCO has now did their global release of their ST7, which is their seven ton scoop at CIM in Vancouver in May. Uh, so that's been officially launched. It's coming right off the production line uh, with electric, uh, with the electric motors and with our, uh, with our systems. So that now is coming right off the line. Uh, they've also done some 20-ton tr uh, trucks up at uh, Kirk and Lake Gold. I think there's three of them now. Um, and Kirk and Lake Gold has six 20-ton trucks all together, uh, Copco and other OEMs. The, um, <coughs> uh, there's, a, there's a number of different pieces of equipment that are uh, available. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about uh, some of the smaller equipment, uh, the one and a half uh, yard. And we're looking, uh, there's, not, uh, there's not solutions that are available uh, with our existing uh, companies, OEMs that we're working with. And we're looking at doing that, our, uh, we're looking at building one of those ourselves and we're starting to do that. So I want to talk about that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> those are the different sizes of motors that we have. Uh, so one of the benefits is we, we can do the full fleet. Um, that's kind of it's kind of interesting to have the uh, the same equipment that's available, so the same parts. Um, the traction motors are are these ones, and they're the same across all the equipment sizes. Um, and uh, this uh, this <laughs> this is the auxiliary motor, uh, and this is the main motor. Uh, the, in the smallest one, we don't. Uh, we just have the, uh, the the one motor. But that one motor is the same as the auxiliary motor in the two uh, bigger uh, size uh, structures. So we do have a we do have a motor that does the uh, that does the equipment, and then a separate one that does the hydraulics, so that there's no competition for the uh, for the power coming out of the battery. Is there a limitation in how big you you, know, you can't drive a 40 ton truck with these? Uh, that one we can do with we can do the uh, we can do the 42 ton with uh, with this one, with this one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 Is that the limitation? Is it sort of the uh, we can build a uh, we can build the engine to do any size of truck. Where the where the issue comes and my right now it's at anything above 50 ton. It gets to be a challenge, but what the challenge is is where we're going to put the battery packs. Uh, in a truck, we have to put the battery packs where the diesel engine would otherwise be. And as trucks get bigger, um, the engine size, the diesel engine size does not scale at the same rate the payload does. So the amount of room we have for battery cells uh, goes, is, is, not, is not as much. So we can't get enough battery cells in um, the trucks that are going to be carrying 70 or, uh, or 80 if we get up to those uh, so 80 tons. So we need higher energy density. We need to get those lithium cobalt batteries underground. Yes, we need to, uh, yeah. We need to start a bonfire underground and we can uh, haul as much as we want. But no, the, techn the technology will catch up and it will get there. The battery can be distributed. The batteries can be distributed all over the truck. Uh, yeah, and we've looked at having we've looked at having two, but they're they're big. They're big. So the yeah. the, the motor itself we can kind of yeah. slide uh, slide anywhere. So yeah. the motor itself is quite small, but the battery pack is quite big. Like this, uh, the battery pack that would do. Oh, let me go to the next slide here. Uh, yeah, that battery pack is. Um, like three tons, I think. But like they're be, huge. Can they be distributed over sure, a yeah. large truck? Yeah, you, you can, but you need to find the room. Yeah. You need to find the room, and you can't, uh, there's only so much yeah. um, fab uh, additional fabrication you yeah. can do to put in more batteries. But yes, you can have, uh, you can have them around, around the truck, okay. for sure. But yeah. uh, it still gives us a challenge when we get above 50 ton, yeah. in my view, right now, with the current technology. Yeah. Yeah. John, could yes. you get some sort of fire suppressant? on a lithium cobalt battery to get around that issue you have? The, uh, it's, it's a really dangerous fire. It doesn't need oxygen <laughs> to burn, and it can't be put out with, uh, it can't be put out with fire extinguishers. So you could bury it, I guess, to put the fire out, but I'm not, it's still, it's really a challenging fire to put out. That's the, that's the issue with lithium cobalt. It's a scary, scary fire. You, you let it burn. So if your car, if your Tesla catches on fire, you let it burn. Sorry? The two components that you need are both in the battery. It's like having oxygen in the in a gasoline tank. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Squeeze it yeah. Out. yeah. 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 So you can cut the oxygen off, that doesn't it's stop the, it. It's the process of 
problem is going to bump up because the sooner you have a safe battery, the engineers are going to increase the, the density and power density. Right. <coughs> so it's challenging to put out that. That fire is a very challenging fire to put out, which is why we're staying away from it. But how do they put it out now? Uh, let it burn. Let, let it burn. Let it burn. Yeah. Yeah, which is uh, above gr above ground on the side of your the highway is fine. Let it burn, but underground, it's not fine. Right. And how much smaller would it be than, say, in your largest size? Uh, a lot, a lot. I don't I don't know how I I, I don't know exactly how much because we haven't we're not doing them. Uh, so I don't. But it would be it's a it's a lot better energy density. And I think the way to look at it is you'd be able to let's say with your hauling uh, let's say with the duty cycle for your haul trucks, you have to swap twice during the shift. You probably wouldn't have to if you could do cobalt. So it really is a great solution, except for the fire, except for the downside. Um, <coughs> the main, it, it, yeah, the, in, in the pits it can be done. The main, from an economic standpoint, the main benefit that you're getting from going with a battery uh, solution is you save ventilation costs. You don't have to do the airways, you don't have to do as big of fans, cooling plant. Uh, with an open pit, ventilation's free. So you don't get that savings. If you want to go for it for the greenhouse gas uh, and for the, you know, the other, the other benefits that it brings, you could. And some companies are looking at doing that. And you could look at those chemistries for that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and of course, there's the chargers that we have. The master charger, which is this bad boy. Um, when the battery connects to that, it has uh, it sends reports to our office. So we get reports on how the uh, how the batteries are functioning. We can then have live communications with the uh, maintenance group to discuss maintenance uh, protocols and what needs to be done. So uh, we then get detailed information on duty cycles that we can use to plan out what the equipment can do. So we're pretty confident with our ability. We have over 100,000 hours of, uh, of hours underground. We're pretty confident that we can map out uh, with a very high degree of accuracy uh, how long we can go on a certain uh, on a certain ramp on a certain grade? How far we can go between swaps? Uh, so we get a lot of useful information from this, and that's available to the mining companies to the extent they want to look at get data in order to help run their business and manage the mine. Uh, a lot of data comes out of the the scoops and the haul trucks uh, through the uh, that comes in every time they go to charge. Um, the uh, next four years, some of the things we see, so we've looked at, uh, mines haven't been designed uh, for downhill carries. Typically, they haven't been good ideas. You just, uh, your, your driver has both feet on the brakes as hard as, hard as humanly possible. You're creating a lot of heat. Uh, you're wearing down your, uh, your equipment. Uh, with battery, that changes dramatically. Uh, you can have, this is one area where you can have the bigger haul trucks because if you can plan your mine so that your hoisting is at the bottom of the ore body, uh, you can then haul downhill fully loaded and come up empty. And you will never have to recharge your battery using power in that case because the, uh, the, uh, the braking goes directly into regenerating the battery. So gravity pays for your, uh, your fuel bill. It's even better than solar, isn't it? Gravity is a nice <laughs> source of alternative. How's that for a source of alternative energy? Gravity. Um, the um, <clears throat> so that's an interesting part of how you can build a mine to take advantage of uh, some of the things that battery-powered electric can bring to the table. Um, and we'll see, I think we'll see that happen uh, more often as more mines come online, taking this into account. Um, ore passes, uh, some people like them and some people don't. One job we worked at, they've had a lot of challenges with ore passes and poor ground conditions, getting clogged up, uh, putting, you know, halting production while they have to fix it. And they just decided, hey, we like the, let's just get rid of all these ore passes and we'll just haul downhill. It's free to haul downhill. Yes, we need a bigger fleet to do it. We have to worry about congestion, but uh, you know, on balance, it gives you, it at least gives you this option you can consider. If you still want to go with the ore passes, you can still go with them, but this does give another option uh, that allows you to think about how you may want to do things. Um, the, in the pre-production phase, driving ramps, so if you're, uh, 
if you have if you've if you've financed your mine you're going ahead you're building it it's your sole project uh, markets foaming at the mouth waiting for this thing to come in production if you can go to the market and say hey we can bring this thing into production three months earlier than we said before that's going to get a very positive reaction uh, on your valuations and how battery, uh, uh, how battery can do that is you can have some pretty uh, significant limits on how much horsepower you can throw at driving a ramp uh, until you can get a good ventilation source. So you're driving your ramp when you get down to a certain stage until you can hook up with a ventilation shaft. It's really tricky to get uh, to be to be working with uh, diesel going down into that ramp, and you may have limits on how much equipment you can throw at it. Um, if you go with battery, you may have some options to have, uh, have more horsepower be dedicated towards that, uh, that process of driving the ramp. Uh, same thing would happen with doing, uh, with doing bulk samples where you have to drive down to the, uh, to the ore body. Same would happen if you're doing an expiration at it. There's a lot of, uh, you can reduce the timeline by throwing, uh, throwing uh, uh, more horsepower at those functions. Um, how much time do I have? Five ten, five ten. Okay. Um, thanks. The uh, the capex. We've done some detailed uh, stuff. Well, we haven't. The um, um, the uh, the smart people in the world who uh, know mining and engineering have done uh, some detailed studies. We've looked at a mine that had uh, done its feasibility study based on diesel, and it then redid it based on batteries. So this gives us a really interesting comparison of the different costs. Kirk and Lake didn't didn't do that. They just they knew what the capex number was going to be if they went with diesel to do the ventilation uh, shaft, and they just wanted another solution, and they found one. And they didn't really do this kind of uh, uh, A versus B trade-off study. Um, but this uh, this uh, this uh, this other one was a very interesting scenario. So they uh, um, I th and they were looking at doing a it's a base metals mine. It was deep. It was hot. Uh, they had the diesel plan, and it was going to be expensive to ventilate. Um, so they went through and looked at it from, uh, from an electric, electric uh, equipment, battery powered electric standpoint and looking at full fleet. And what they found was the airflow requirement went down by 40%. Um, the, uh, the number of air raises, or sorry, the number of airways uh, went from four to three. And they really thought on a, that on an optimization study, they might be able to get that down to two. That was a significant CapEx uh, reduction. Uh, they were able to reduce the size of their uh, cooling plant quite, uh, quite substantially by 25%. Uh, the number and size of their fans was reduced. All in, this, uh, this generated CapEx savings of $50 million. And there would also be annual savings uh, from reduced power costs uh, down the road. So this is a very, very powerful uh, full option for them and really is going to change the, uh, really is going to pay for the equipment by having that, that, that capex savings. Um, now the issue is, it's, uh, if it were only a gold mine, it would probably be going ahead, but it's not, unfortunately. Um, what was the original capex? Uh, um, it, would have, I, I was, uh, it was around 200 million, I believe, 200 million. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, Uh, yeah, one th thing about gold prices coming up and the market coming back is I, I, I think that's going to lead to some pressure to go towards uh, zero emissions. One, I think a lot of mining companies are going to uh, really want to go towards that if they can make the cost side of it work and make it pro do it profitably. Um, but I also think there's going to be some pressure coming from governments, and governments will, uh, have been holding back. They know that the uh, uh, they knew that they know that the diesel particulate matters are uh, are dangerous, uh, but they also don't want to put the mining industry out of business, and that's that's good. <laughs> that's good. I don't think they should be uh, putting in regulation that puts the uh, you know puts half the mines out of business. Uh, but with the gold prices going up, there will there may be some more pressure to go towards these types of solutions, just from a health and safety standpoint. Um, and I think now that we have this, now that we can get the cost side working, uh, that'll be a, that's a that's a wonderful opportunity to uh, to move on these alternatives. <coughs> um, I think it's going to be led by big miners, so um, <coughs> that'll be led by the by Glencore's Valley, Gold Corp, 
Um, those are Barrick. Those are the ones that I think will be leading it, and uh, and others will come up. I think the the Kirkland Lake being the first one to really go out and try this was really fact specific, and due to uh, their management team at the time saying, "Let's just figure it out and do it," and really being being open minded and looking for alternatives as opposed to just discarding the uh, the uh, South Mine Complex. Um, but I, now I think this is going to be something that's going to be uh, there, there's going to be big companies that are going to be driving this. They're going to come out with uh, building mines with zero emissions, and that will uh, lead others to uh, to follow. Um, we have uh, we have a we have a we're looking we're building a scoop now that's in the uh, one and a half yard uh, size, and it's because of a demand. And um, you know we've been working with Copco; they don't have that product in uh, they don't have that product, so we can't get a, a battery version of it. And we're going to do. We're going to do our uh, we're going to do our own because that equipment is needed, particularly in the narrow vein uh, mines. Uh, and when we do it, um, we're a California-based company. Uh, we think technology. That's the way we think. And there's going to be uh, technology is going to be brought to the scoop in everywhere, shape, or form that the mining industry can use. We've been. Um, one, one, one example of this, and I, I'm just going to give a simple example. There's going to be others that we're going to, uh, that will be included. We're going to be unveiling this at Mine Expo in Las Vegas in, uh, when is that, September, I think, or October. Um, so one, one of the things is when there's a problem with the scoop, there's going to be, um, there's going to, it's going to be highlighted. Uh, the operator <laughs> will be able to have live discussions with the technician. Uh, the technician will, uh, can take control of the scoop and be able to operate it much the same way as your IT department does when you're uh, if you're bumbling like I am on the uh, on the computer and can't figure it out you talk to some guy who just takes control and clicks on all the right things and fixes it uh, so that will be uh, that will be done uh, it'll be totally integrated with the uh, uh, with the uh, with the parts so that if parts needed it gets it gets ordered it goes to the uh, purchasing group uh, so that function will all be automated within this uh, within the scoop. Um, the, um, the other thing that we're going to do is there's a, there's a lot of technology now that's, that's coming and we want to be able to build our equipment so that it can accept the technology when it comes. Um, <laughs> part of our company in California, we've hired, we've hired some of our engineers from the uh, aerospace industry and the thinking that comes along with that is you know much the same as you would think of in the aerospace industry. So our 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 theory on this is build hardware that's a lot more than you need, because you know there's going to be solutions that are going to come up in the aerospace in instance. It's up when you're up in Jupiter, you're going to have some new software that you can push down. You want to make sure the hardware is going to be able to handle it, and that's what we're doing with our equipment. We're going to have the hardware capabilities when it comes time to get new, when new software is available to handle different technology functions that the mining industry needs, there's going to be the capability so you don't have to go out and buy a new scoop. It's going to be ready and you're going to be able to push it down and we're going to help make that happen. Uh, so a lot of the things that we're, you know, everyone's talking about remote mining, autonomous mining, uh, people are getting new efficiencies uh, from battery technology that are coming. Uh, people are looking at reporting, getting access to data, getting these reports from the scoops. What do we do with it? People come up with new ideas. It's going to be a push of software into the equipment so that we can get uh, this coming up. Um, and uh, again, the key thing is the, uh, the longer battery life and the performance. Uh, we're, we're, we're done our new, uh, our new battery size now, our new battery cell that's going to be available for the 40 uh, ton plus equipment. Uh, that's going to be available with better, uh, with better for performance and that's going to get better every year. And we're going to be able to push that into the new equipment as, uh, as and when it's available. Uh, the one and a half yard scoops that we have are going to have three times the power that the diesel variety would. <coughs> Main reason is they can do the diesels that strong but the emissions rules won't let them. Uh, we don't have those rules to worry about so we're at the performance wise those scoops are going to be much better. Uh, it, that's going to be the big, that's the biggest opportunity because it is going to get better. 
it's going to get better. They will perform better. Uh, they will perform longer. We'll have uh, we'll get more power into a smaller area. We'll be able to go with uh, with, with the bigger equipment. Uh, the the energy density is going to get better on batteries, and uh, that's the the issue. If I have to say where the issue is now, it's not with scoops. The issue is with haul trucks because going uphill fully loaded, uh, you just can't you can't go the shift. Can't even go anywhere close. You need to do a couple of uh, swaps during the shift. And people look at that and they go, oh man, we have to swap. That means 15 minutes we're gonna be down. How about if something goes wrong? There's a lot of hesitation on that. Um, and we'll, you know, I think the solution to that is mapping out what the impact's gonna be on tons that you're hoisting. We need to look at this from a tons perspective. And a lot of times where <laughs> mines have had a goal based on tons, we're able to get there. But we're, we're gonna be able to get there in even more situations uh, as the technology gets better. Okay.